path we follow is called a noble path. Both because the activities of the path are noble activities, and because it turns the people who follow the path into noble people. In other words, it's ennobling. It fosters noble qualities in the mind, the qualities that make us mature, that make us adult. That in a John Lee's image places us on a throne, so we're not slaves to craving, out there bending under the whip of wherever our desires may send us. The path puts us in a position where we're above the desires, we're above our cravings. We can direct them, seeing which desires are skillful, which desires are unskillful. And learning the persistence and uh, wisdom that will enable us to follow the skillful desires and put the unskillful ones aside. Seeing what truly is in our own best interest. In other words, sorting through the imperatives our appetites place on us and the imperatives that society places on us. learning to figure out which ones really are skillful. We're sorting out both areas, because we come here with a head full of all kinds of notions from what our parents have told us and our teachers have told us and the mass media have told us. And our basic desires, our hungers, our appetites. And that combination can be particularly dangerous, because there are parts of society that would want us to follow our appetites. What was that old commercial, you know, obey your thirst? So that you buy our Sprite or whatever. We have to put ourselves in a position where we can sort through those things. What lessons have we learned from society that are good lessons? What impulses do we have that are good impulses? How do you foster those? And how do you learn how to say no to the, the bad lessons and the bad impulses, the ones that are unskillful? It's interesting that the, the Buddha's take on maturity is very similar to what psychotherapy has to say about maturity, the good functioning of a wise ego. has its parallels in a lot of the Buddha's teachings. We're often told that ego is a bad thing. Ego in the sense of egotism or selfishness is a bad thing. But the ego in the sense of learning how to function in a way that figures out what is really in your true best interest, and learning how to filter out your impulses and the voices of society, that's a very necessary function. It's one that has to be developed if you're going to be able to stay on the path. Psychotherapy talks about five healthy ego functionings, and I'd like to talk about three. All five of them have parallels in the Buddhist teachings, but there's a cluster of three that works together in ennobling the mind. first one is anticipation. You're able to look ahead into the future and see the results of your actions. This is a sign of a healthy ego, so that you don't just give in to your impulses. The desire for the quick fix, the inability to delay gratification. Someone was telling me that psychotherapists have discovered that children who are 
raised in such a way that they learn delayed gratification, do well in life. Well, that's, that's one of those obvious things we don't need psychotherapists to tell us. You see it all around you, the kids that are encouraged to give in to their impulses are the ones who have real trouble in life. It's the ones who learn how to say, no, this is not good right now. I've got to put aside my desire for the immediate pleasure, for a longer-term pleasure down the road. Those are the ones who function well in life, and that's an important part of the practice. One, the ability to see the danger that comes from giving in. In the Buddhist terms, that's heedfulness. And as the Buddha said, that lies at the basis of all skillful qualities. It was so important that it was his final lesson before he passed away. You realize that there are dangers waiting out there. You act in certain ways and they're going to have bad consequences, both for yourself and for the people around you. So you want to develop that ability to look at your actions and see where they lead to down the line. We talked a little bit about this this afternoon, but the consequences of breaking the precepts. Because it's so easy to break a precept, especially when, we've, when you feel that you're put at a disadvantage by the precept. We saw all that insanity after 9-11 where people were willing to throw morality out the window because they were so scared. And you even heard some Buddhist teachers saying this principle of you know, hatred is never appeased by hatred, it's only appeased by non-hatred, i.e. goodwill. They said that was totally useless, didn't have any practical application. That principle was designed for times when people really are just seething with hatred and they have to be reminded that you can't put aside your principles in a situation like that. Because the first impulse may be not your best impulse at all. You need the precepts to keep reminding you that under no circumstances would you kill, steal, have illicit sex, lie, or take intoxicants. That's why the precepts are so simple, because they're easy to remember in difficult situations. And they're meant to remind you to be heedful. Think about the consequences of your actions and learn how to foresee danger. That ability is what makes you mature, and it helps to ennoble you. So you don't give in to your impulses. Okay, once you see that something is going to be unskillful down the line, you have to learn how to suppress it if it's coming up in your mind, if that desire is coming up in your mind. We don't like the word suppression. We tend to confuse it with repression. Repression is the unhealthy way to react to unskillful mental states. In other words, you pretend they're not there. And because you pretend that they're not there, you're in huge denial. The large parts of your awareness get cut off. And those impulses just are allowed to fester in their little hidden corner or their little locked up room. They don't stay locked up for long. Suppression is something different. It's the ability to say no to a desire as you know it's happening. You know it's there. But you simply learn how to say no. Now, it's not just saying no. The Buddha gives you ways of thinking that help you say no. The two qualities that he says are treasures of the mind, the protectors of the world a sense of shame and a sense of compunction. Shame is when you have enough self-respect to be able to tell yourself, I don't want to do that because it would be beneath me. This is where a strong sense of self is very helpful. A sense of self-respect is very helpful here. 
and its respect for your teachers and all the people who have helped you along. You'd be ashamed to have them know that you had done that particular thing. Or you're ashamed yourself that you've gotten that good of training and yet you throw it away. And so shame here is not a debilitating sense of that you are a bad person and that you're ashamed of yourself. It's a sense that you're a really good person, you've received good training. And a certain action you might be thinking about following that action, but you realize it's beneath you. It's not in keeping with what you know to be true. That sense of shame is very helpful in suppressing unskillful desires. Compunction is the ability to foresee a dangerous or to foresee an undesirable action, <coughs> an undesirable result of an action, and say, I just don't want to go there. Again, this is based on goodwill for yourself. Realizing that the little bit of pleasure that comes from an unskillful impulse now is not really worth all the danger that comes down the line, all the sorrow and suffering. You care for yourself. This is where you show goodwill for yourself. This is why it's also possible to translate this quality as concern. In other words, you're not apathetic. You don't have a who cares attitude. You care. Because you realize that once you've done something unskillful, you can't buy it back. There's that line in the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, the moving finger writes and having writ moves on. Or all your eloquence or wit can lure it back to something like erase half a line, or all your tears wipe out a word of it. In other words, the moving finger that writes the story of your life, you're the one who's writing the story. And if you've written a bad bad action in the story, a bad chapter in the story, you can't go back and erase it. So keep this in mind, that your actions do have consequences and you really do care about yourself. You don't want to destroy your happiness. And if you can develop that sense of concern and compunction together with a sense of shame, it really helps you to say no to unskillful desires. So when you're saying no to these things, you've got to find other things that you can say yes to. And that's what a third principle is. It's called sublimation. Which means you take your desire for pleasure and you channel it in skillful ways. This is why we have the practice of right concentration. That's the aspect of the Four Noble Truths where the Buddha talks very openly about pleasure, rapture, a sense of fullness in the body, allowed to spread and permeate throughout the body, the way cool water spreads through a to a lake, a spring-fed lake, the cool water of the spring fills the entire lake. Or lotuses growing immersed in the lake, or thoroughly saturated in the water of the lake. It's a really intense pleasure, a really intense sense of well-being. And when you can tap into that, it makes the ability to operate on heedfulness. sense of shame, sense of compunction, it makes it a lot easier. You're not just denying yourself. You're learning where to channel your desire for pleasure in a skillful way. And the Buddha's realization that this was the path it came after he had spent six years of undergoing all sorts of self-inflicted tortures, afraid of pleasure of any kind. When he realized that that wasn't the path, then he asked himself, well, what might be the path. And you remember the time he'd been pra practicing John. He hadn't intentionally been practicing John. He'd sat under a tree and his mind had just naturally settled into the love of the first jhana when he was a child, a sense of ease and rapture. 
So he asked himself, could this be the path? And he had an instinctive answer, yes. But that pleasure, he said, why am I afraid of that pleasure? After all, it's blameless. It's not harmful. It's not unskillful. So he made, his up, <clears throat> he made up his mind not to be afraid of it. That was the first factor of the path that he realized. And if you're going to be doing concerted work on your mind, you have to be able to tap into a sense of well-being whenever you need it. Otherwise, the work gets dry. This is John Fuhring once said that meditation loses its lubricant. Like an engine that runs out of oil, it just seizes up. So for the path to stay alive, for you to stay on the path, requires being able to tap into this sense of well-being. Simply sitting here, breathing in, breathing out, it feels good all over the body. That's the skill of right concentration. That's where you sublimate your unskillful desires and you direct them here. There's a phrase someplace in the canon, I don't know exactly where, where the different levels of right concentration are called the sport of the noble ones. This is where they have their fun. They find their pleasure, they find their sense of well-being. They find their enjoyment here. So remember, the process of getting the mind to settle down should be an enjoyable process. You find that it's getting dry. Learn how to think in ways that give a little more moisture, more lubricant. The Buddha talks of a person working on the process of establishing mindfulness, either in the body in and of itself, or feelings in and of themselves, mind in and of itself, or mental qualities in and of themselves. You focus on these things and sometimes it gets dry and he says there's a fever appears in the body or a fever appears in the mind. Even though these are the themes of right concentration, you're not finding them very easeful or rapturous. So he says to focus on a topic that you do find inspiring. It might be the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. Qualities of generosity, goodwill, any of the Brahma Viharas, the practice of virtue. You contemplate these things until the mind feels inspired. It gets, it gets its lubricant. Then you can settle down with a breath again, and you find the mind will settle down and be still. So the practice of concentration is designed specifically to give you that sense of pleasure when you, whenever you need it, because the work of insight is sometimes very difficult. The mind is going to resist unless you learn how to put it in the right mood. All of these skills are the skills of a mature mind. The ability to anticipate danger, the ability to say no to unskillful desires, and the ability to channel your desires for pleasure in a harmless direction. These are all noble activities that bring dignity into our lives. Years back, when I first came back to the States, I was giving a Dharma talk one night, and there was a Russian emigre in the group, and I had mentioned the topic of dignity in the talk. And after the talk, she came up to me and she said, you know, I've been in America all these years now. I learned the word dignity when I was studying English in Russia, but I never heard the word dignity come out of an American's mouth until today. That's something to think about. This is why we so sorely need this path in our country, this ennobling path. That's why we so sorely need it ourselves.
because it's the only way that we're going to find a happiness that's noble, harmless, blameless. A happiness that allows us to maintain our dignity and our nobility. So this is a very precious path. Learn to value it. And allow it to do its work on you so that whatever noble qualities you have can be brought, as they say, to the culmination of their development. <laughs>